Hi everyone, my name is Ibrahim. I work as a doctor in the NHS. In these videos titled Your Specialty of Interest, we bring out a single specialty uh, and we talk about the pathway of training and how an international medical graduates can get into the specialty training. Today, we're going to explore the specialty general surgery. If this is the first time you're checking out our channel, welcome. Basically, what we do is we run a website that's totally free known as roadtouk.com and it will explain the ins and outs about everything related to the United Kingdom and what it takes for you to work as a doctor in the NHS. So if you've not already, please stalk us on all of our social media. Find us on Facebook, find us on Twitter, Instagram, and of course, YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe. So when I first started looking at the curriculum of general surgery, I found that there is a very latest curriculum which we'll implement from this year, 2021, of the entire general surgery curriculum. So our entire video is based on that document which is available on the internet on GMC's website. To be honest, before making this video, I had bits and pieces of idea about how the whole general surgery training uh, is run in the United Kingdom because I myself as a medical trainee, uh, it was not my business to know in detail. Uh, but after knowing all of this in detail, I find it that it's really a very modular type of training which encompasses different branches of surgery and uh, gives the trainee an option to choose which pathway they want to make their career in. Uh, please stick around till the end of this video because it is a very vast specialty to explain because it entails a lot of things in it. And at the same time, I've explained all possible pathways an international medical graduate uh, can obtain starting if they start very early in their career, from middle of their career, even if they are specialist in outside the UK, how they can come and join a, uh, become a specialist in the UK. We discussed it all. So either grab a popcorn or grab a cup of coffee. Uh, let's get started. So let's start with uh, the, the, the initial things of what does general surgery entail? So in the United Kingdom, general surgery training is basically has three domains of the entire training. So first, obviously, is the elective general surgery and then emergency general surgery. And on top of these two, you can obtain a special interest in any of the specialty. So those are the subspecialties that we'll be discussing uh, in the next few slides. So in, in if you become a general surgery trainee, you'll have to have some sort of special interest or subspecialty included within the training curriculum. So as I said earlier, uh, the entire training pathway that I'm going to discuss here is based on this new general surgery curriculum, which you say it's dated on 4th of August, which hasn't come yet. So it will be implemented for the entire general surgery curriculum in future, I mean this year. So the entire pathway that I'm explaining today in this video is based on this curriculum. Please be aware that this whole curriculum thing is subject to change. So if you're watching this video much later than this date, this video is getting published, make sure that you look at the curriculum, which is easily available on the General Medical Council website because uh, the Joint Surgical Training Committee makes a curriculum and they submit it to General Medical Council to accept it. So it's the final thing which is accepted by GMC uh, will be accepted for specialist registration in future. So make sure you uh, look at that if you're watching this video much later than uh, when it is published. This is the bare bone structure of any specialty training in the UK. So as you can see, after being a medical graduate, they join foundation training, which is two years. And if the specialty is an uncoupled specialty, uh, then there is a core and specialty training is separate. So there is a recruitment at core training level, like right here, and there is a recruitment at here as well. But if the specialty is a run through training, then there is only recruitment here and based on their progression through the training, they progress through specialty training without any further recruitment in here. So general surgery training uh, has both of the pathways. So you can have it uncoupled core training, or also you can have a run through core training module, which will progress you to the further higher specialty without having to go through another recruitment pathway. As you can see, there are two exams in general surgery. One is MRCS it's membership exam which you have to pass before you join higher specialty training and there is frcs which will be a part of uh, uh, almost in the middle of your higher specialty training 
But for international medical graduates, there is a twist in the whole training pathway because they have to opt in GMC registration. So they can opt in GMC registration by any of the pathways that GMC accepts. After obtaining GMC registration, they can join a non-training job or even foundation training if they're eligible to do so. Or if they don't join foundation training, then have to apply uh, for a non-training job, which will enable them to get a crest form, which is equivalent to the foundation training. This e crest form will make them eligible to join the core form of training, any CT1 or ST1 level. So ST1 I say for run through and CT1 I say for core training. They can do, or if they don't want to do core training or they have equivalent core training elsewhere, they can sign an alternative core competency form, which is equivalent to the core training and pass MRCS and other relevant things done for a higher special training application and they can join Hajj. This thing will be more explained in uh, the future slides, but to understand any training pathway, this, this you have to ingrain this in your brain. So a common question is whether to join foundation training or get a crest form signed. I don't want to elaborate this in detail. Dr. Ibris have done an excellent explanation of this video, which would be the best first job for an IMG based on what their uh, like you know situation is right now please please watch this video for further explanation whether it's better for you to join standalone non-training or if you're eligible for a UKFP or foundation training so let's move on to core training uh, so joining a core training is a very competitive process which we will discuss a bit later in this video about how can you gain a competitive edge in joining a core surgical training so as I said there is another surgical module which is called improvial surgical training which have been piloted recently uh, specifically started for general surgery training so making general surgery a run-through training if you join IST so the application uh, criteria the, the selection interview everything is similar for these two core surgical training improvement surgical training but you just have to apply for uh, like in in online application form you just have to apply i want to apply for ist so once you apply for ist that means you're in for a long ride but for core surgical training you're just doing two years and then you have to decide which surgical uncoupled surgical uh, specialty you want to pursue but improving surgical training for after joining the first year or like you know you have to talk to your training director that which surgery uh, higher surgical pathway you want to pursue so they will uh, modulate your training that way so you gain those competencies to progress to that training so there is not many post of IST as of yet they have piloted it I think in 2017 or 18 and then a few other specialty joined this like vascular surgery and urology and I think from this year trauma and orthopedics will have some post of IST as well so when I say trauma and orthopedics having some post of IST that means you're in for a ride to become a trauma and orthopedic surgeon if you join their improved surgical training that means you're joining a run-through program of trauma and orthopedics from CT1 ST1 level but if you join core surgical training, that doesn't guarantee that you will actually get into trauma and orthopedics because that's an uncoupled surg core surgical training. That means after CT CST is done, you have to join another uh, competitive pathway to join an ST3 of trauma and orthopedics. So wrapping your head around these two bits of idea about what a uncoupled core surgical training and what's a coupled improving surgical training is necessary when you join it. So obviously when uh, people are more motivated, I mean, I'm, I'm say, say a surgical trainee is like bound that I want to join urology and I don't want to take another recruitment for S23 urology. So I will try my best to get a urology IST post. So there you go, that's how it works. So during this core training module, you will have to also pass MRCS and the whole process is uh, uh, like you know structured with workplace based assessment to assess your progress of trainings so workplace based assessment like case based discussion clinical evaluation exercise dops procedure based assessment all those other things are inside this whole pathway where you have to maintain a portfolio to show your progression during this training and then you finish the training become eligible to apply for higher surgical training so if you want to bypass this whole core surgical training, you have to work on your own accord and fill up this alternative core surgical competency form. I think this form for surgery is termed as certificate of eligibility to 
enter higher surgical training. There is a new form out there where it entails the same as the crest form, which has its own points in sections and subsections where a consultant has to observe you doing all of this thing and they can sign you off for the entire core competency, which will be obviously more difficult because it's not a structured pathway. It's your own uh, pathway where you have to prove your competencies by yourself without the proper guidance or anything like a training program has. Uh, but if you can obtain that alternative core competency form uh, you are, and also complete MRCS, you can apply for a higher surgical training. Let's say for now, there is a restriction to join core surgical training, which a lot of people get confused about. And, and we get a lot of questions about like, oh, if I can't join core surgical training, then what? Stick to the video. <laughs> We'll answer this question in the end, obviously. So there is a there is a big criteria of overqualification in core surgical training. If you have 18 months or less experience of surgery, only then you can join core surgical training. That means if you have more than 18 months of experience in surgical field, it can be any surgical specialty and it, it's equivalent to a full-time job and in any country. So and after being fully registered, say you have uh, been working in say in, in a surgical ward in, in, in a public hospital or anywhere in private hospital or whatever as a clinical experience for the last say two three years and now you decided to come to the UK so that like you know if you're more than two like two years is basically 24 months so if you have more than 18 months of surgical experience and th there's a question as well like how would they know it's it's obviously your time frame and everything has to be submitted as a part of your application since from graduation what did you do uh, like you know a, a job experience and everything wise if it accounts to more than 18 months of experience you will not be considered in your core surgical training application just to give you a visual representation of how it looks like i just made here as well because this is a very uh, confusing to a lot of doctors and we get a lot of questions regarding this as well so if you register a doctor and you have 18 months of surgical experience, your CST application, okay. If you register a doctor, I'm saying registered because it doesn't matter where you register. It could be a GM's registration, it could be your home country's registration, so it doesn't matter. It, it all have to add up. So if it's like a, a one year of uh, your home country experience and then you obtained six months of UK experience, then it becomes total 18 months experience. So if it's less than 18 months experience, of CST application, okay, but if it's more than 18 months of experience, then CST application, you are overqualified to apply for core surgical training. Now, let's go a bit deeper into how the whole specialty training for general surgery, it's a higher specialty training after your core training is done or your MRCS is done, which is a phase one of the entire training pathway. Uh, you have to apply if you're doing a core surgical training an interview for to join the phase two or if you are doing an improving surgical training then you bypass this again in application and interview to join a higher surgical training phase two is indicative four years here you uh, is a modular structural training which we'll be discussing in the next slides but you will be working as a general surgery registrar so and then phase three is indicative of two years where you will um, more work towards getting your subspecialty interest and the whole training is obviously assessed by workplace based assessments uh, which goes to your e-portfolio and in this phase three you become eligible to uh, take fellowship of the royal college of surgeons exam and then you get cct so this is the entire pathway if you look at it if you core training for two years uh, then the specialty training for six years so it's a basically uh, eight years of training to obtain CCT. So obtain CCT at the same time, general surgery and other special interests that you have incorporated in your specialty training, which we'll be discussing right now. Okay, so modular structure of training. How it's modular? Because the whole pathway of these four years of training is not just one general surgery. It's a combination of a few different specialties where you have to choose which one you want to do and based on the provisions in your training area you will be provided uh, with opportunities to uh, like you know grow that special interest so obviously elective general surgery 
with uh, either emergency general surgery, elective GI surgery, you have to do both of these in the first four years, and then any of the following. Here comes the whole breadth of different subspecialty or special interests that we talked about. So now you know if you want to be a vascular surgeon or trauma surgeon or a colorectal surgeon, upper GI surgeon, this is your pathway. So you join CST, join general surgery training, and work towards getting into your special interest areas when you are a higher surgical trainee. So this is phase two is done, then comes phase three. So you have developed some interest areas in your phase two. Now in phase three, you do a bit more work towards that. But elective general surgery is obviously a part of the whole training. At the same time, you have to choose any of the following like emergency general surgery or pancreas transplant, organ retrieval, transplant surgery, or breast surgery. There is an asterisk next to breast surgery because if you choose breast surgery over anything, that means you have to choose the breast surgery in the next selection criteria as well. So you'll become a general surgeon and a breast surgeon at the same time. Here comes the whole pathway, whole different other subspecialty interests as well. So as you can see, uh, based on what you did in the last, uh, like, you know, before pre previous phase two, in phase three, you get more option of combining uh, your general surgery, emergency surgery, and any of the special interests that you, you want to gain. So by looking at this whole modular structure, a general surgeon trainee has actually becomes a master of multiple trades. Uh, how so become, because they obviously can run a list of elective general surgery. That's the basic, uh, like, you know, structure of the entire training. And at the same time, they create subspecialty interest in any of these combined modules. You can become emergency general surgery with GI. You can become colorectal with emergency breast surgery, renal transplant, then you can transplant surgeon. So you see all these couples of modules, it's available to you when you go through this entire general surgery training. And how will it be available? You have to, uh, like, you know, talk to your training program director, your clinical supervisor, your educational supervisor, which will make you master of multiple trades. Now, this is a burning question. How competitive is core surgical training? It is very competitive because uh, I think the number of training posts in core surgical training is less compared to other equivalent, like, you know, core training, but at the same time, I think it's one of the coveted uh, specialties as well to join. So as you can see, 2018, the number of applications was 1,870, and there were 600 posts, making it a competition of almost three. That means for one post, there were three candidates applying for this post. In 2019, it was this, competition of 2.93, and in 2020, I think it became much more competitive because RLMP was lifted, so for one post, there was almost four people applied for core surgical training. How competitive is general surgery training? So if you uh, like, you know, already finished core surgical training or uh, uh, com completed an alternative core competency form, uh, is application was 300 for 257 post, which becomes a competition ratio of 1.54. To be honest, it's not that competitive. It looks like in 2018. So in 2019, uh, the ratio rose to 2.16 and in 2020 the ratio became 4.61. You see there's a good decline of number of posts available to train which fluctuates based on the availability of the like you know provider of HEE and NHS and all that. So it's, a, uh, it's, it's like you know it's complicated how the number of training uh, fluctuates over the time but it is how it is. So it's it's very competitive in 2020. I mean, for one post, there was five people applying for this. So obviously, how to achieve a competitive edge in training application? I'd be more uh, gearing towards for core surgical training because I think that's applied to a lot of people. So there there, there is a whole application scoring system for core surgical training where they have discussed about different aspects, which gives you how much score. So even before you get uh, like, you know, a call for an interview, you may score a lot higher if you obtain this, all of this that I'm going to say right now in your portfolio to show for and work towards getting any of these things. So obviously commitment to special, commitment to specialty surgery can be proven by getting MRCS done, 
some surgical training courses like basic surgical skills, care of critically ill surgical patients, and all those other things. And then surgical experience, like you know, if you have a logbook of different patients that you have assisted or worked. So all of this has to be evidenced, but signed off by a consultant. Or you can arrange for a surgical taster week, uh, and that can also help in your prove that you are committed to surgery. I have started this whole uh, slide based on which is more achievable towards that which is difficult to achieve. So QIP in clinical edit is very achievable. This pointer will give you the highest point available, but if you just do an audit and you have not presented it to a national meeting, it will still give you a point. But this, if you fill up this uh, ex descriptor, it will give you the highest point. If you play a leading role in a sustainable change QIP and then present it to a national meeting. Teaching experience as well, if you just teach a bunch of medical students and get their feedback, it will give you some points if you have those feedback, but if you do this, this will give you the highest point possible. So obviously I put this down as like, you know, give you an idea of what's the highest you can target. If you can't achieve that, at least do something related under this heading. The next thing comes is a training in teaching. If you have a postgraduate PG cert or PG diploma under any university in medical education, uh, if you have a presentation made, an oral presentation and national international medical or invited or selected to do this, will give the highest point in presentation. If you have publications, if you're a first author or a joint first author of two or more PubMed cited original research publication or in press, give you the highest point. But if you are a co-author of a PubMed cited uh, original research publication, it will give you some point. Even if it's not an original, if it's a case report or something, it will still give you some point, but it has to be PubMed cited journal. Uh, leadership and management, if you hold a leadership role or a managerial role in the provision of healthcare or six or more months, that will give you the highest point in this leadership and management. This is quite uh, like difficult to, uh, if you have not already done so, you can just start right now and get it done. So if you know it, if you're a medical student right now and want to join surgical training in future, you can probably plan to get this done, get an MD done in somewhere uh, by research or um, MS, that's, I mean, this kind of master's degree basically, or if you get an intercalated degree in something else, in bachelor's degree and get a first class honors or equivalent, or if you get some prizes, some awarded related to medicine, or if you get a high achievement like distinctions or honors uh, in your subject, in your primary medical qualification, that also gives you some points. So if you have already passed your primary medical qualification, you cannot go back and get honors in that. But if you're a medical student, if you want to be excellent, uh, then you can probably work towards it. So this is in a nutshell about how we can get a competitive edge in training applications. You have to have at least something uh, to show for in all of these criteria that I have just explained. Now the question comes, how much is the pay of general surgery training? I think we, we try to debunk this idea a lot as well. I'm going to say it again. I think I'm going to say it in every video. You are getting paid to become trained. You don't have to pay for your training. So, and you're getting paid at a national uh, scale of the training. So there is no, like, you know, there is no distinction like a surgical trainee will get paid more than a gastrointestinal trainee or uh, like, you know, a, a GP trainee will get less paid than a neurosurgical trainee. It's not like that. So based on what level are you, so if you're an ST3 level, you'll get paid regardless of what your specialty is. So it's a national pay scale. So this pay scale uh, is for England. From ST3 to ST4, the pay is, oh, let me just put the pound signs in. So the consultant starting salary is 82,096 and it increases over time based on some awards and how many years of uh, service do you put. And the consultant salary can be very variable in different specialties because this is the NHS salary. You can work alongside NHS in private sectors where it's very variable, you can earn a lot more than uh, like what is shown here based on how you have made your job plan as a consultant. But for trainee, uh, uh, you have to work in the NHS only. You cannot uh, like, you know, do private work as a trainee because you're a trainee. Uh, ST3 is, to ST5 is that, uh, 53,077 per year. This is the basic salary. So based on uh, what kind of rota you're in, if you are on a very busy rota, if you're doing on calls really frequently, then you'll be getting more uh, enhancement on top of this basic rota, uh, which goes probably 
uh, to 30 to 40 percent, like you know, if you're on a very busy rota. Uh, but if you want a uh, like you know relaxed rota, you get weekend shift are uh, not that regularly, and you do don't do on calls that regularly, then probably the enhancement will be lower. But this is uh, the general pay structure for trainees and consultants in the NHS, and this is for England. Now, let's let's move on to a, 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 this slide. Will be longer, and I'll take much time explaining this slide uh, for IMG specifically. So obviously, you become a medical graduate, and your first step would be working to get full GMS registration. Uh, if you want to know how you can get full GMS registration, there are a bunch of videos on our channel, and we have written a bunch of articles as well. Please go through that first, and. After getting full GMS registration, our um, recommendation, if you want to join a surgical pathway, is to do a non-training job. So keep in mind about that uh, overqualification criteria, because if you're coming to the UK already 18 months or more, I mean, more than 18 months work experience, that means your path will be completely different, which we'll be discussing in this slide. But if you have not, just remember when the next CST application is, looking at the recruitment timeline and, and which specialty you want to join to start non-training jobs. So many doctors work and in emergency medicine because working in emergency medicine gives you uh, like, you know, exposure to all sorts of specialty. Like you can get a surgical patient, you can get a pediatric patient, gynae patient, medicine patient, everything in emergency medicine. And this emergency medicine will not be counted towards your 18 months of surgical experience. Or, or if you join like, you know, but if you join general surgery or any kind of surgical uh, SHO job or a non-training job, it will be counted towards that 18 months. So think about that, what kind of job you want to do as a first job if you want to apply for core surgical training. Then comes, obviously, if you want to join CST, you have to get a crest form signed. Uh, that's a given if you have not done foundation training. So if you do foundation training, the pathway is absolutely similar as we have discussed in the earlier slides, foundation training, core training, and the specialty training. But if you join this non-training job, you have to get a crest sign and CST. The exclamation mark is that remember, remember the overqualification criteria of 18 months. So if you've joined CST, IST, you finish MRCS, and then you join general surgery training. Now, if you are overqualified to enter into core surgical training, your only pathway remain to join general surgery training is Get your MRCS done, obtain full GM station either via MRCS or via PLAB, and then join a non-training job at SHO level or a registrar level if you have an MRCS done already, and work towards. Uh, okay, you, you can actually if you join this uh, uh, full GM station by MRCS already, and you start a non-training job, you can get a crest form signed and join CST as well if you have not like you know being overqualified for that but if you are then the pathway left for you to do an alternative core competency form sign and join general surgery so in turn the red pathway is for those who have been deemed overqualified for core surgical training so you have to be get full gms registration join a non-training job get mrcs done get this alternative core competency signed and only then you can apply for general surgery training so if you're still confused about what is the difference between a training and non-training job, I have explained here in this article, in this video, which was a part of a, a like, you know, NHS jobs application. Please give this uh, a view and, and, and find out about what's the differences between training and non-training job and when can you apply and uh, all sorts of uh, things explained there. Now, this route of uh, being a specialist is uh, one of the most complicated uh, I would say, or this is this is this is there to help even the trainees of the United Kingdom who failed to join a competitive, uh, like you know, a pathway to join the higher surgical training. They can plan their own pathway and apply to GMC based on all the evidences and everything they gathered and apply for an equivalency of being a specialist. Previously, it was called Article 14, but now it's called CESR, or like, you know, publicly it's called CESR route, which is stands for Certificate of Eligibility to Specialist Registration. Say you are in a non-training job, you are, you are being a registrar, you passed MRCS, but you failed to join, say, higher surgical training or any kind of uh, specialty training pathway. 
So what will you do? So you can work on your own speed, on your own uh, like you know pathway, and gain those points a trainee would do by yourself on your own accord, and put it in your portfolio. And there is a complete guidance about application, how to apply for CSR, and along the lines of your working. So how long will it take? Normally, for a surgical trainee, it takes six years to complete everything. So for you, if you want to do non-training job for six, eight, ten years. It's completely up to you how long does it take for you to gather all these evidences and all these evidences have to be robust. So it has to be proven to this body of uh, like, you know, committee that all those you have done actually proves that it is equivalent for a trainee what would have done as a trainee. There is a complete guidance by Joint Committee on Surgical Training. If you go to their website, Joint Committee of Surgical Training, Crest, they give you guidelines on what do you have to do for CSR for general surgery? What do you have to do CSR for cardiothoracic, urology, vascular, and everything? There's a complete guidance there. So, for uh, the firstly, you have to obviously get FRCS done. Uh, I, I think I, I don't think there is any way out without passing FRCS that you can prove that you have equivalent competencies of a FRCS exam. Then others like skills and experience, there's criteria like you have to maintain a e-log book of different surgical uh, cases that you have done. Uh, you have to have at least a minimum of 1600 cases in log books uh, and you have to have procedure-based assessments. You have to have case-based discussions and everything. So at least 30 case-based discussions documented that you've discussed with consultants and everything uh, in your log book. And then you have to obtain some papers, uh, like, you know, publish some papers and some presentations. I think there's a criteria where you have to have three peer reviewed papers, not case reports, and at least three first author presentations at a regional or national meeting. And uh, then you have to get some uh, courses done, which would be like management in the NHS or say training the trainers course or an updated advanced trauma life support course. You have to get some audits done as well. You have to at least have evidence of three audits uh, and, uh, and and one audit cycle to be completed and also you have to have structured reference at least six structured references from NHS consultants and at the same time who is your clinical educator so you see this is not an easy task uh, and and to to get this done without ever working in the NHS I would say it's quite impossible because all of these things are very related to how healthcare is uh, provided in the NHS. So if you are already a consultant elsewhere in the world and you have a specialist recognition, say somewhere outside UK and you want to join, uh, like, you know, as a UK workforce, you want to become a specialist, you have to work towards getting all of this done and prepared and then apply to GMC for a CSR application. The, then GMC will advance that application to this Joint Committee of Surgical Training and they have given you a guidance already how the whole thing would be assessed uh, and done. So if you just follow their criteria and work towards getting it done. So if you are a consultant elsewhere in the world, probably it may take a few years in the UK to gather all of this uh, or maybe more than a few years, but it's not impossible to do. As I said earlier, even some UK graduates, UK trained, UK core surgical trained, they also choose to CSR out just because sometimes some competitive specialties are really competitive to join, like say for neurosurgery or cardiothoracic surgery, CSR out is there. It's a guidance by the joint committee. If you just follow that route, it's very achievable. I try to be quick and uh, uh, like, you know, try to give you core uh, and important pointers in this whole specialty pathway. I, I, I would be, I would be like, you know, honored if you don't have any questions, but if you do, please don't forget to ask uh, in the comment section below, we're happy to answer. There you go, there was an elaborate explanation of how the general surgery training pathway is structured in the UK. Um, I have tried to become uh, as uh, like, you know, concise as possible. But as I said, if you have any questions, don't forget to ask in the comments below. Uh, and if you haven't subscribed to our channel already, please subscribe and turn the notification bell all. Uh, please subscribe and turn the notification bell on so that you can notified whenever we 
come out with a new video we'll be coming out with more specialties in future and discuss this way the whole pathway please stick with us and have a nice day thank you